How many of you have heard of Mary Mary? <laughs> Mary Mary. I want to talk to you about Mary Mary and another one of their friends called Salome. It's not another lady who they kicked out of the group, like Destiny's Child kicked out those ladies. She was never with Mary Mary, and we're not speaking about Mary Mary, let the shackles of my feet so I can dance. We are speaking about the original Mary Mary, perhaps where they got their name Mary Mary. There are three ladies, Mary, Mary, and Salome. One is named as Mary Magdalene in the Word of God. Another one is just called Mary, the mother of James. I recognize that culture <laughs> where people are just given the name of their child, Mama Blandina. Um, Selena, you'll be Mama LJ in some places. You know, you grow up without even knowing some people's surnames or even first names. I remember there are some people when I was young, you would ask me, Who, what, what is this person's name? And I can imagine maybe going and filling out a form and having to write down the name of your auntie <laughs> and realizing you don't even know what your auntie's name is because you know her as Mama Someone. So we have Mary Magdalene. We have Mary, simply the mother of James. And then we have Salome. Three ladies whose lives are written in history. I think they're amazing ladies. In the midst of the biggest and most momentous occasion in the history of the world, in the history of existence, I would argue with you that there is no greater moment than this Sunday morning. And on this Sunday morning, the first people we hear about are these three ladies, Mary, Mary, and Salome. This is in a time where we are living in a, let's say, a male-dominated society. And many parts of the world and in this place where they were, you could argue it still is. In this male-dominated society, we hear about three women. Mary, Mary, and Salome. This is in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 to 5. You can read it in the other Gospels as well, but we'll be reading from Matthew 28, verse 1 to 15. Differently today, I will not read through the whole scripture. We will go verse by verse. And we are going to try and learn from these women, learn from what their response and their actions and what God was doing. Mary Magdalene seemed to be the leader here. She seemed to be chief among these ladies. So our focus will be on Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, during this season, we see her, she's all over the place. Mary Magdalene, she shows up at Jesus' death. She is there at the cross. She doesn't really have a job there, but she's just there. Nobody has given her any task. Many Men have run off. Many men are hiding somewhere. Mary Magdalene is just there. We just, she's mentioned, she's just there at the foot of the cross. She's just there for support. I can imagine how important it must have been for Jesus in the midst of the pain, hanging on the cross, supported by nails in his body, being mocked. They're putting a bit of vinegar wine and trying to force it on his lips when he was thirsty. They are tearing and they're just, they, they, it's, it's, it's fun for a lot of these soldiers. The Pharisees and the Sanhedrin are rejoicing. Finally, the man that was a challenge to them, they see him hanging on the cross. There is no more final image and vision than that for your enemy when you see him hanging on the cross. In the midst of all this, 
Jesus, when he looks down, one of the people he sees is Mary. It is important for him to see Mary because she represents love and gratefulness, gratitude. And you will come to understand why Mary was such a grateful, grateful woman. We read in Mark chapter 16 verse 9 that Jesus cast out seven demons from this woman. Jesus cast out seven demons from Mary Magdalene. If you've been around people who are believers and perhaps you fall in this category as well, you may find that the people who feel that God has done the most for them are probably most grateful. People who feel that they can do, they don't need Jesus, they're not grateful. They may be religious, they may come to church on Easter, they may do certain things that make them seem like they're holy. But you go and find somebody whom have received such mercy and grace from God. And you can see that their Christianity and their faith is different. And it's all a matter of perception. It's a matter of perception of how great your sin and your situation was. Mary Magdalene has been called a prostitute, a former prostitute. I don't agree with this. But it is something that in the church people have spoken and preached. They assume because she has seven demons who she's delivered from that she must have been an immoral woman, a woman who was a woman of the streets. But when you do proper research and when I've looked at the culture and looked outside of when the Bible speaks about this, generally people that were suffering from mental health were seen to be people that are demon-possessed. They were seen to be people that were under the evil spirits. We all know that the understanding and our understanding of mental health has, has become a lot more holistic now. But the Bible speaks about mental health in so many places. It speaks about depression from David to Moses to many, many people in the Word of God. Different varieties or extremities of this suffering. Because we are all made, we, we, we all have a mind. And the mind, when it goes through trauma and stress more than what it can handle, then it becomes sick. Jesus, I just spoke about when we are having Holy Communion, struggling with mental health. At the Garden of Gethsemane, if you truly listen to his words, this was a man that was suffering with anxiety. He had anxiety in that moment. So he understood people that were cast out, who were labeled. And so this woman, Mary Magdalene, having all the issues that she had, this is my understanding of this woman. She was perhaps an outcast. And we've seen Jesus many times dealing with outcasts with such love and compassion that it completely changes their lives. The Bible says in Mark 16 that she had seven demons that he cast out. This is what Mark reported. Jesus never said that he's casting out demons. Mark reported that this is what happened. And so this woman was cured of whatever problem that she had. After she was cured, you can see that her life was completely dedicated to Jesus. When Jesus was in Galilee, this woman is the one that supported him in terms of materially and food and, and looking after the disciples. It is Mary Magdalene. She was always around. She was never designated disciple. Judas was designated disciple. But I believe she was more useful than Judas. She was a disciple of Christ. And she understood what Jesus did for her. I don't know if you, like me, can cast your eyes back and know what Jesus did for you. 
Your life may have not been so extravagant. You may not have been a, a, a bank robber. You may not have been excessively sexually promiscuous. Everyone has their journey, but your sin was a seed of death. And it was creating death and turmoil in your life. And I'm telling you that Jesus, when he met you, when he did, he turned your life around. I can assure you, you would not be where you are right now had it not been for the love of God. Had it not been for Jesus. Look, maybe let me talk, let me speak about myself. And I don't like to speak about this because I need to preach the rest and I feel emotion coming. I see where my life was. And I see where Jesus took me from. And so, some may have seen me and thought I'm a bit too much. I will be and I will continue to be too much. Like Mary Magdalene. I will be everywhere. As long as the Lord allows me. I will just be hanging around. And I'm going to show you that this heart of dedication and seeking and just hanging around Jesus is what caused Mary and these other ladies to be written in the history of the world at the most important time in the history of the world. Hallelujah. Because she just knew that life before was full of irrelevance and pain. She knew how the people treated her. She saw it, she experienced it. Jesus came, saw her suffering. Whether it was mental health, whether it was like most people say, a whatever it was, Jesus came and embraced her and brought her unto himself. Her life was changed by love. Hallelujah. You know, people's lives are changed by love. Not necessarily by our words. Not necessarily by our positions. I may be a pastor, but me being a pastor may not change anyone's life without love. You may be a parent, but you may not impact your children's life without love. You may be a neighbor, and you may be a very good neighbor. But if you're not emanating the love of Jesus, the people on your street will not change. Jesus, it was love that, let, that drove everything that he did. I pray that we become people full of love. Because love will change people. I'm telling you, love will change people. That brother in your family that is just has been difficult all your life, why don't you try a different approach? Pray to God and say, Lord, show me how to show love to this guy. And you will see how he will change. Hallelujah. Now let us talk about the setting. The day before, so this is on Friday, Jesus dies. He is crucified. We would say that he probably died around 3 or 4 p.m. The Bible says it was around the ninth hour. Around 3 or 4 p.m. At 6 p.m., the celebrations of the, um, the Passover begin. So he's passed at 3 or 4 and at six, celebrations for the Passover are due to begin. Joseph of Arimathea, a closeted disciple of Jesus. <laughs> I was speaking about this last night in our prayers on Facebook. He's among those like Nicodemus who loved Jesus in secret. They loved Jesus, but they were in the closet. After witnessing what he witnessed, he said, I don't care anymore. And so he goes off and he, went, he goes to see Pilate and he goes to ask for the body of Jesus. I want you to think of the time scales that we have here. He's asking for the body of Jesus. How long did this take, do you think? He has to go and request for an interview with Pilate. You don't just walk into Pilate's office. He has to go and ask for an interview, plea his case, Wait for permission. Once this permission is given, 
He has to then take the body of our Lord Jesus down from the cross. You can imagine the logistics of this. I don't know whether he had help or not. He has to go. The cross is standing. I imagine they would have drilled a hole in the ground, nail the criminal on the ground, lift him up, maybe pull with ropes, I don't know, and the cross would drop into the hole. From what I've seen, that's probably what they did. So now he has to go and get our Lord's body off the cross, pull out the nails, and carry him to the tomb. So at this point, he has to try and wipe down the body. There is blood. It is a desert. There is sand mixed in with, you can imagine, and you can imagine that now what time is it? Maybe 5 o'clock, maybe 5.30. He is racing with time. He is not supposed to be handling the body by the time 6 p.m. gets there because it is the beginning of the Passover. It is culturally not allowed. And so he is rushing, he's rushing the body. He's got spices. It's a rush job, quick, quick job. And he goes, maybe... You would find Mary is probably behind him somewhere wailing, not able to help much. They go, they get him to the tomb. And in the midst of all this, there is a stone that they have to roll onto the tomb. The stone was very heavy to move by oneself. And so it is all these logistics and organizing. And by 6 p.m., the must have been done. But it's a rush job. Mary is there because she was following the body of Jesus all the way from the beginning of his suffering. And she is there and she is seeing that Jesus' body has not been treated in the way the body of our Lord ought to have been treated. I'm saying this so that you can understand the time. If he gave up his life at three and they have to be done by six, and all these things that have to happen, it was not a well done job. Can you agree? It was not a well done job. Why am I saying this to you? I want to highlight to you the heart of Mary. I want to make it, I want to highlight to you the heart of somebody that is in love with their Savior. The heart of somebody that recognizes what Jesus has done for her. And I'm not claiming that Mary was in any revelation that Jesus was going to resurrect. You know, sometimes when you know something like that, you will be at the front eh? so that you can be seen in history. When their history is being written, nobody knew. They were all blinded to what was going on. Even though the Bible and the prophecy had written about this several times, Peter's behavior Judas' behavior, the behavior of the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, clearly shows that nobody was none the wiser to what was going on. Mary is the kind of person, because of the gratitude that she has, that would just go and say, I know my Lord is gone. I know all the hope that I shared with all the other brethren is gone. The teacher is gone, but I will go and make sure that his body is well looked after. Because Joseph didn't do a good job, not by his own fault, but because there was not enough time. I pray that God gives you the sort of heart of gratitude of daily remembering Jesus, that your actions will reflect a life of gratitude. When it comes to service, when it comes to people and love, it is constantly, what did Jesus do for me? This woman, she knew what an outcast looked like. She knew the life of an outcast. I want to tell you today that don't get comfortable and complacent in your position where you are right now. Let us not use language lightly and say it is by the grace of God. It's become vocabulary for the Christian. 
I can say to Bishop, I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, no, Bishop can say to me, Peter, I'll see you tomorrow. And I can say, yes, by the grace of God. <laughs> it is vocabulary for a lot of people. It just rolls off the tongue. But the reality is, it is by the grace of God that indeed he will see me tomorrow. I have witnessed people's lives change in an instant. I have seen rich men and rich women, their lives changing in an instant. I come from a country where I saw rich people. You know, governments in Africa, when you are a, 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 a governor or a minister or a head of something, a director, unless you have very good morals, it is your chance <laughs> to steal, properly steal. I saw people's houses in Rwanda that were mansions that you cannot see here in the West. And in months, the same people are living on handouts. Like this. Handouts. If you could give them a bit of maize meal, they would be so grateful. I've seen some of those people in this Europe, many of us have come and become refugees and I've seen them doing the lowliest of jobs. The jobs that they are doing, they will never greet someone doing that job back in Rwanda. I don't know if you've experienced anything like this in your life, where someone's life changes. So when I'm standing here in my suit, I ought to remember and recognize that it is by the grace of God. Mary did this. When you go and turn on your heater at home and it gets hot and you go and have a bath because you choose to or you have a shower because you choose to or you have both, you do what you want because it is by the grace of God. It is not your education. It is not your, 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 your life planning. It is not because you decided to do A, B, C. There are people who made better choices than you and I. Who are homeless on the street. There are people who do everything right. Eat well. Eat well and treat their bodies like a temple. And they are stricken by a disease. And then you have people who just eat whatever they want horribly. And they are still alive at 90, 95. <laughs> and you're looking and smoking 20 a day. It is by the grace of God, my brothers. My sisters, it's by the grace of God. And Mary Magdalene... She, she knew where she came from. And she was saying, I'm going to... Where was everybody else? I remember Jesus feeding 15, 20,000 people. Where were they when his body needed to be treated like that of a king? Those that were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, last week. To the king, to the son of David. Where were they when this king's body had to be taken down the cross? And go and to be cared for. We live in a world where people forget. We forget quickly. And once we see that our benefit is gone, we are off. Mary, she was just following behind and she's calculating. And she's saying, no, this is not on. I'm not having this. I am in pain. I'm in agony. But I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back and deal with with the body of my Lord. And so at the break of dawn, Mary could not come back on Saturday. The whole of Saturday was the Passover. It would be strange for her to be seen going to the tomb. In fact, it may be criminal. I probably need to do a bit more research on this, but it may have been criminal. And so... The Passover ends at 6 p.m. It is now night. It is dark. Mary says to her friend Mary and Salome, he says, we have to go back to the grave in the morning. We've got to go to the tomb. We have to go to the tomb. Because the body of our Lord Jesus was not ceremonially dealt with in the right way. There was a rush job. I can imagine a conversation. Let's ask the men. Where is Peter? 
I don't know where the men were. The men are in their grief at this moment. Some of the men are probably thinking, ooh, I wonder whether my fishing nets are still... <laughs> Some of the men are probably thinking about the boats. Because for them, it's finished. They've been following someone for three and a half years of their lives, put their businesses on hold, put their families on, and now it's, it's finished. And if they have the brain that I have, in that moment, calculations, recovery, how do we recover in this situation? At the break of dawn, here comes Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, and they come to see the tomb. The word that is used for see in Greek is theoreo. So the English languages say that they came to see the tomb, but the actual meaning of the word is to discern or to seek. Or the word can also be used to say to enjoy the presence of. So you could say that they were going to the tomb to enjoy the presence of. The presence of what? Of a corpse? What were they going to discern? There was much more than seeing that was driving these women. Verse 1 says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. This is, we are reading from Matthew chapter 28. Some other gospels also include Salome in this. And so at the break of dawn, they go to see the tomb. They haven't slept for days, I'm sure. They have signs of tears all over their face. They are in such depressive states. Their reality is saying to them, move on. Go and sort something out. This man is dead, he's gone. That's what everything in them is saying. But their hearts, their spirits are saying, no, let us go and investigate. Let us go and see. These women are carrying about 75 pounds or 34 kilograms of spices and herbs. 34 kilograms of spices and herbs. That's a lot of spices and herbs and perfumes. It didn't take this much to sort a body out. I've gone and looked at what they used to do. It did not take 34 kilograms of spices and herbs is a lot. They are carrying this. They are going to finish the burial ritual. They are, going to go, they are going to get into the tomb. That's what the plan is. How are they going to get into the tomb? They don't know. Who is going to roll the stone away? They don't know. <laughs> they are just walking with their spices. They know that there is a massive stone that takes several men to remove they know that the tomb is being guarded by soldiers. That's what the Bible tells us. And these are not your average soldiers. If we understood what was happening and how angry the Sanhedrin was and how the Romans would have felt this was a sensitive situation, I can imagine they would have posted special forces types of soldiers. SAS kind of individuals. To guard the tomb in case somebody comes to steal the body. They knew that this was a chance or there could be a, 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 a threat of revolution because they know how the Galileans felt about Jesus. They had seen how the man came into the city and he was a, applauded and given more praise than Herod would receive. And so this was a sensitive site. They put guards on this site. Three women are just walking, armed with spices, to go and investigate. They are seeking. Hallelujah. They are seeking with their whole hearts. They don't know what it is they are seeking or what they are going to find, but they are seeking. I pray this afternoon that God will help you to seek. 
The Bible says, seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all things will be added to you. Just seek. These women who are seeking, just seek God. If you recognize that he's done something for you that is worth your time, then just seek him. Don't seek God with an agenda. Stop seeking God with an agenda. Saying that I'm seeking God so that I may be better off. So that my life may improve. No. Seek God because you love him. Mary Magdalene, there is nothing that I believe that she had in her mind that she was going to receive at the tomb. Instead, she was going to give. So her seeking was attached to giving. Many times our seeking is attached to receiving. How many of you, and if you're honest, I'll put my hand up first, whose prayer life increases when times get hard? When you're facing a problem, then you call the brethren. Let us pray. Then intercession. Tuesday evening, what time does it start? Brother, caution. Why are we late? The Zoom link is not working. You are there when times are hard. Seek God because you love him, not because you need him. Not because you need something from him. Because what he has done for you is enough. Hallelujah. It is enough. But he's a God of mercy and grace that even though he, he sees many of our hearts, Seeking with ulterior motives, it still comes. That is the sort of love and person that he is. You may not have the answers or even know the question, but keep seeking. You may not know how you are going to make it. Keep seeking. You may think you are certain of what he is. Like Mary, Mary and Salome, they were certain and sure he was dead. Yet they went to, to seek. They went to discern. And look at what happened when these women seek. Look at what happens when you seek God. Hallelujah. I want to make an encouragement to mothers in this moment. Continue seeking God for your children. Don't give up. I'm saying this because I don't know where brothers, where were our brothers, honestly? Where, where was Peter? Where was John? Where was James? Where, was, where, where are these people? The, these, our ladies, our sisters... And I'm telling you, a woman that is on fire for God, seeking God, I just think there is something else. There is, there, is, there is a different dynamic that takes place when women seek God. I'm not saying men shouldn't seek God. But women, even in a society where men take precedence like them, seek God and take the initiative. Hallelujah. Take the initiative in ministry. And the men will just catch up. Verse 2, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. When they went to seek, an earthquake happened, like what had happened a few days before. And they came in contact with an angel. You see where Mary Magdalene's heart of loving God where he's taking her. She's now encountering an angel. Keep seeking and don't get discouraged. Jesus will bring you through whatever it is that you may find yourself in. Just keep seeking. Hallelujah. A violent earthquake takes place. They say this angel grabs this massive stone and moves it. They were going to the tomb not knowing how they are going to have this situation solved. And there's an answer. Because it began by seeking. They did not know. Had they known an angel would come and roll away the stone, then they would have gone. But they did not know. And yet they went. Hallelujah. Keep seeking. Keep seeking. Whatever stone is keeping you from something, God is going to roll it away and an angel sits on a stone. What does this illustrate? Do you guys, those of you who used to watch wrestling, you know one, the wrestler, when he puts someone down, some of them would sit on the person. 
just to show that I'm now, I've conquered you. Or when you're playing, when you're, my boys, when they play, uh, when one is on the floor, there's always, it's a natural thing, you just sit on the person. And it, it just signifies victory. Hallelujah. You are going to see victory in your life when you seek God. Amen. Verse 4, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. So we have these special forces, guys. They see an angel and they shake, they tremble. They fall, they're like dead men. But the women, with a heart to seek God, they are standing. And the God speaks to them. I pray that as you seek God, there will be situations that take place in your life that will shake everybody around you, but you remain standing. That is, that, is the, that is your portion. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. Your security will be added to you. I don't care how the economy is and how it's going to look. Like these people that saw the angel, these strong men, specially selected by Rome and by Jerusalem to guard the body, at the sight of an angel, and at his voice, they shook. And they were down like dead men. See the demons around you shake when you go to the place of an encounter with God. They will shake and they will be on the ground. And you will stand and hear the voice of the Lord. Hallelujah. They shook in fear. They shook in fear. And one of those things, there are people who dream when they are being chased by something. And reacting to different things. There are some who run and there are some whose legs go like jelly. I'm the one whose legs go like jelly. And I wake up and I ask myself, this was your dream. Like, do, have you ever asked like, come on subconscious, like, ca can I not be stronger than that in my own dream? Like in my own dream, what, but your legs, they just go and you just become like porridge. That's what happened to these men, specially trained, on the floor trembling with fear because they were in the presence of God. They were somewhere that they should not be. There was an encounter with Mary and Mary and Salome and they were trespassing the encounter. Hallelujah. They were trespassing the encounter. I declare that there are people who are operating in the darkness that are in your business that are going to tremble because they are trespassing an encounter that you're having with God. They are trespassing an encounter you are having with God and it is your time. Don't worry about them. Don't worry about the strong men. Don't worry about the strong men. I love how God works. Had he sent some big guys, disciples who are muscle bound, maybe we could have misunderstood what happened. We would have said that maybe they knocked these guards out. These are three women. These are three women. There is no room for misunderstanding. And God likes to use lowly things like that. Have you noticed how God likes to remove your input in anything that he does? When God wants to do something great, he wants to make sure at the end of it you can say, Lord, it was you. He doesn't want you to share the glory, to say, Lord, you are a great partner there. Like I did 60, you did 40. My wisdom there and some of your input, we did this. God likes to do things where there is no confusion as to who did them. And so when you are in a situation right now, even in your life, and you are facing a challenge, but you don't seem to have the ability to solve it, you can still speak in faith. Just walk, go. Like Mary Take what you can do. What you can get is the spices. Those ones you can get. The perfume, those ones you can get. Your legs, you can get them. Your body, you can wake it. I know you are grieving. I know you are sad. But just get the ladies. Let's go. How and who is going to roll the stone? We don't know. How about the guards? We don't know. Jesus loves a I don't know guy. I, I don't know woman who just seeks him without having to have understanding of how they're going to get there. Just seek the Lord. Hallelujah. 
And that's why the Bible says that the wisdom of the world is like foolishness to God. And God's wisdom appears like foolishness to the world. It appears foolish to the people of the world for three ladies to go to anoint a body inside a tomb whose stone they cannot roll away, which is being guarded by special forces. It sounds stupid. And it's probably the case that they did say to some of the brothers, let's go and they said, mm, you can't do it because of A, B, C, D. Do you have that friend who is very good at listing the, 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 the impossibilities? Someone who will tell you you can't do this because of A, B, C, D. And the more you listen, the more discouraged you will become. You will not set off on your journey. Sometimes when you hear somebody is telling you what cannot be done, just move away from that situation because your spirit is being destroyed. Your faith is being destroyed. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Doubt comes by hearing, hearing the word of the enemy and doubters. The enemy will always put people around you. Pray that it's not your spouse. If it is, you've got a lot of work to do. You've got a lot of fight so that their mindset may be changed. If you have somebody next to you that is a constant naysayer, you can't move away from that one. That one is your burden to pray. Hallelujah. Verse 6. The Bible says he is not there. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, behold, behold. I have told you. He is not here, they told the ladies. This angel told the ladies. He has risen just like he said. When you seek God, you get to a place and then revelation is given. Now they are coming into a place and he says, like he said he would. Ah. Revelation. Spiritual light bulbs. These ladies would have never received this revelation had they been in their squalor crying. Had they not gone out to say, let us go and do the work of the Lord. And so I want to encourage you, my brother, my sister. Your victory begins with you seeking. Sometimes you think that you want to see the, 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 the blueprint. But God is saying to you, I will not show you a thing until you set off. Until you set off knowing that you don't know where you are ending up. But you are just setting off in faith. Revelation would not be given to you if you are sat there waiting for it to come to you. You need to walk towards God and you will find revelation. Seek, navigate and seek. God loves somebody that just gets up and goes. I want to be one of those people that just gets up and goes. I don't need, and for me, those of you who know me, I, I like to understand things. I like conversation. I like, I, I fancy myself as a bit of someone who has intellectual conversations. Maybe that's my delusion. But I, I like to understand. I really do. And if you're like me, people who like to understand, they have a problem. I'm telling you. If you are, we are all intelligent, everyone is intelligent. Your intellect will stand in your way. I'm telling you. If you are, you think you are intelligent and you like to understand and you like to reason and you like facts and you like, and, and you like things to make sense, you are going to hold yourself back. Because God has more intelligence than you. That he just wants you to just follow and let him drip feed you with revelation and information. Because he says that if you sit there and try to understand, you won't get it anyway. You will not understand anyway. Can you imagine having a little child? Grace Lynn, she starts talking and Pharaoh and Ben are saying, let us go, we're going to Middlesbrough. And she says, how? We're going in the car. How is the car going to get there? And then now Ben and Rufa are trying to, to explain internal combustion. They're saying that our car takes diesel, and so the diesel is, goes into the pistons, and then grazing the pistons. Explain pistons. You see, 
Sometimes when we seek understanding, God looks at us and just says, get in your car seat. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. You will get to where we are going. What you need to know is your tablet is here and your milk, when you want it, just cry or say, I'm hungry. Whether the car has been serviced, that's not your business. There is a point will come where it will be her responsibility to know, has the car been serviced? When she comes to pick up her parents when they are 80, and she says, I want to use your car, is your car serviced? Then it is her, she's grown up, she's mature. But at her age, she has no business trying to figure out how she's going to get where she's going. Our intelligence compared to God is like that of somebody who has just been born. But we like to think ourselves to be very intelligent. God says to you, just move. Let's go. He will give you obedience markers. He will say, do this. And there are things that God has already said. You just do those ones. It may not make sense. Just do them. And so what Mary had to obey was her conviction that Jesus and his body had to be sorted. Because he deserves it. Because of what he has done for her. And so she was off. And now she is meeting revelation. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. You've got to seek first. It doesn't say find. It says seek and then you will find. You've got to seek first. Finding comes after seeking. Knock and it will be opened to you. Come and see the place where he lay. The angel said to them. When you start seeking God and you get to a place where revelation is given, now God trusts you enough to start giving you evidence. Hallelujah. When you seek God, sometimes God will leave evidence. I was having a conversation with someone yesterday and this morning. They, they know themselves. God will leave evidence. Hallelujah. That you are seeking. Sometimes you, why the evidence? Because he wants you to know that you are on the right path. That's why. So he says, come. Come. I want to show you evidence. He is not there. Look at his linen. And then he says to them, in verse 8, no, in verse um, 7, he says, go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Now, other people who are now planning returning to their boats are now being rescued and realigned into their mission because of these women seeking. Hallelujah. At this point, God is now going to use you when you are seeking him and you start to find him. He's going to use you to be a blessing to other people. Hallelujah. He is not here. They are, he's saying to them, where death was, he's not here. You are seeing an empty tomb. That's what we are rejoicing today. Mary, Mary, and Salome, the first people to be told that he is not here. Praise God. Who are they? Were they in the Sanhedrin? No. Were they Pharisees? Were they rich? Were they men? Because being a man seemed to also be a commodity. No. Mary, on her part, was somebody that was despised already. I wonder whether the people, society, really believed that she was okay. When you witness someone being delivered of seven demons, there's always going to be, are you going to invite this person to come and babysit for you, honestly? <laughs> someone comes to church and we pray for them, and there is drama in this place. I know you love people, and you'll be like, sister, but... <laughs> You'd be like, I don't, I'm not sure. We'll wait and see. So this, 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 is, this is Mary. That's probably how people treated her. But Jesus treated her like a new creation, someone new. Hallelujah. And that's how he's treating you. And so you ought to be concerned with his work. Amen. And so he says, go and tell others that I've gone to Galilee, that he has gone to Galilee. Go and find him. Jesus decided to go back to Galilee. Remember I was telling you last week, about the Galileans and the people in Jerusalem. 
the Galileans who are ready to receive him. And that's where he went and ascended from Galilee. What was going on in Jerusalem at the time? Those pompous, we have arrived types in Matthew 28, 11 to 15. Let me just read this for you and then we'll finish. Now, while they, are, they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city. Remember those ones who were like porridge? At the, at the, yeah? So now they've, got, they've gathered their strength. They've run back to the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, <laughs> consultation of the evil people, of the people that are deceived, listen to what they come up with. Sometimes you, you wonder what is going on in people's minds. They've just crucified an innocent person. They've just been told that he's now not there. The linen that was covering him is there. They've just told them that an angel has come, did not even hit us, and we were on the floor. They've come and reported these things. What does the people of the world do? What does evil do? They start to discuss among themselves consulted and they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers saying tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept and if this comes to the governor's ears we will appease him and make you secure so they took the money and did as they were instructed and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day they knew Pilate would ask I told you this guy was innocent you forced me to give him to you. Now he's not there. So they said, let us just say that he was stolen. When your revelation is happening and God is doing things for you, always expect that there is people in the kingdom of darkness that will be hatching plans and lies. Be expectant of that. Don't be surprised. When your revelation and you're walking in your revelation and things are happening for you, please, my brother, my sister, don't be surprised. When lies start coming out, when people are speaking against you, it comes with the territory. You do you. Do your life. Enjoy what God is doing in your life. Hallelujah. And continue seeking God. May I humbly ask that we stand and we just pray. We are going to pray and respond to God according to Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 and say that, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Like Mary, many of the Sunday mornings, maybe you are expecting, I will speak about Peter. Maybe you expect I'll speak about Thomas. Let us look at Mary. This for me, she is the hero of this morning. Apart from Jesus that resurrected and gave us life, Mary is my hero. From the lowliest place to a place of honor in history, simply because she was seeking. Not because of any special thing that she did. The Bible does not record Mary performing miracles. It does not record Mary being a super organized person. I don't know what things that would give you accolades her qualification for being a hero was just seeking and some would say seeking blindly her qualification was being there where Jesus was she was there at the crucifixion she's there he's being whipped she's there at his resurrection she's there may I and you become may we become people that are just there where the presence of the Lord is, that we are just there. Hallelujah. Why don't you raise your voice and pray? And just respond to the Lord. How you see fit this morning. If you believe that God has done something for you in your life, that requires or that makes you want to just be there in his presence. Thank you for watching this sermon. I hope you are blessed. Please like the video, subscribe to our channel, and click the notification bell so that you can uh, receive notifications when other videos are uploaded. So God bless you and hope to see you soon.